Yeah, starting with chapter two, Bayes' rule. So the main learning objectives for this chapter were exploring the foundational probability tool. So we uh, got to know about conditional probability, joint probabilities, marginal probabilities, and then it ended with the law of total probability, which allowed us to calculate the probability of an event A using the joint probabilities and the conditional probabilities. And then it went on to introduce Bayesian analysis, like the first formal Bayesian analysis in the form of the fake news example, where we practice like the Bayesian grammar of priors, likelihoods, posterior, and the normalizing constant. And along the way, they also had sort of these simulation exercises where they used R code to calculate these uh, quantities and also do uh, sampling to arrive at the posterior models. Uh, so the first section was around building a Bayesian models for events where it started with the fake news data set uh, in which there were like 40% of the articles were fake and 60% of them were real. So in a way of, uh, and the question was, if we if we have a new article to us, which is not part of this data set to decide whether it's gonna be a fake one or a real one. And the way they presented this information in a Bayesian context was that, okay, the prior is that 40% of the articles are likely to be fake. And then the data, which was like the new article uh, said that, okay, this new article has an exclamation mark in it. And then using these two pieces of information, uh, we arrived at like a posterior distribution on how likely uh, is the article to be a fake one, given it has uh, exclamation marks in them. So these were the two variables of interest, the fake versus real, which is basically our prior and then the data, which is whether or not the article contains uh, exclamation marks or not. And then uh, before sort of formally presenting the analysis, the author asks us uh, of what uh, intuitive, intuitive or gut feeling would be. So um, whether the chances of that article being a fake would reduce from 40% to 20% or whether it would increase uh, to either 90% or 98% uh, based on the fact that exclamation marks were more common in fake articles than in real articles. Uh, and it turned out that I think option B was the right one where the probability or the posterior probability of the article being fake jumped from 40% to 90%. Um, so this was sort of like uh, a quiz before they presented the analysis and the way they went about presenting the analysis of the workflow that they introduced us was we first defined a prior probability model. Uh, then we define a model for interpreting the data or the data model, and then combining these two using the base rule to get the posterior uh, probability model. Uh, anything we want, any questions or anything we want to discuss here before we move to the workflow part? Great, um, moving on to uh, the prior probability model. So uh, basically uh, there are three conditions for a prior probability model to be a valid one. First one that it should account for all events. In our case, it was fake or real. So these were the mutually exhaustive events. And then it says that it needs to assign a probability to each even. So in our model, it was 40% fake, 60% real. And then the evens, the probability of the evens need to sum to one, so 40% plus 60% is one. So this was like our 
prior probability model based on the available data set of the articles. The second one was uh, a model for interpreting the data. And here they sort of um, alluded to the fact that, uh, or highlighted the difference between like a conditional probability function and a likelihood function. So essentially a conditional probability function uh, as defined in the book was uh, the event is fake or is real, is known and has an exclamation mark. Uh, this is unknown. So the conditional probability function translates to like probability that an article has an exclamation mark given it is fake versus it doesn't have an exclamation mark given it's fake. So essentially the is fake part, this is known. And then the likelihood function um, is sort of not a probability, a true probability in itself, but sort of like helps us to evaluate the relative compatibility of the data. So essentially you're saying, so here we're saying that is fake or is real, the status of the article is unknown and has an exclamation mark, which is basically what we can see in the data based on the article's text. So that's known. So here we're calculating the likelihood if an article is fake, given it has exclamation marks or if the likelihood is real given it has exclamation mark. And the way we calculate, we're calculating these likelihoods is just flipping this around to get like conditional probabilities in a sense, as in like the likelihood of is fake given uh, the article has exclamation marks just translates to the probability that the article has exclamation marks given it's fake. And from the, uh, from the data set, uh, we could see that the article, uh, the likelihood of the articles, uh, likelihood of a fake article having exclamation marks was 26.7% and the likelihood of a real article having exclamation marks was 2.2%. And since these are not like, uh, true probabilities, uh, probabilities in a true sense, i.e. they don't like sum to one uh, as such. So when deriving the posterior probability model, uh, we needed this normalizing constant, um, which is based on this uh, probability, the law of total probability, where the normalizing con constant in this case is having an exclamation mark, regardless of whether it's a fake or a real article. And then we use sort of like the, um, the joint probabilities to derive this, uh, i.e. the probability of having exclamation marks can be split as the probability of having exclamation marks and being a real, art real article, or the probability of having exclamation marks and being a fake article. And then finally, uh, the posterior probability model uh, was derived using Bayes' rule, uh, which just equates the posterior probabilities as prior times the likelihood divided by the normalizing constant. So this helps us compute the quantities as probability that it's fake or real, but now uh, we have this additional sort of uh, data or thing that we have learned is that the article has exclamation marks. So given that we have learned this data, how does our understanding of the prior model changes? And that's what the posterior model tries to do. And then they also introduced this sort of uh, shortcut way of calculating the normalizing constant where you don't have to, uh, have to necessarily use sort of this uh, probability, law of total probability approach to calculate the normalizing cons constant. Uh, it's simply uh, the sum of the prior times the likelihood. Uh, and I think in uh, one of the pages, they also mentioned like posterior is proportional to the prior times the likelihood. So once we have the prior and the likelihood, uh, we can get an understanding of the posterior probability model. And um, then this concluded um, saying that, okay, we started off with a prior of 4060 of being fake versus real. 
And then we saw that the likelihood of an article uh, having exclamation marks and being fake was greater than uh, it having like it 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 being a real article given it has exclamation marks. So based on this uh, data, uh, the posterior turns out to be like ninety percent fake and or uh, eighty eighty nine percent fake and eleven percent real. So the probability of the article being fake given it has an exclamation mark jumps from being like forty percent to about eighty nine percent. Uh, based on our understanding of the data that exclamation marks are more common in fake articles than in real ones. And this was this was the first motivating example of, of example of a Bayesian analysis which the authors uh, introduced. Uh, and I think this is a maybe a good stopping point uh, if we want to discuss this um, example in more detail or if it's okay to continue on to the next section. So continue to the next part. Uh, so the next section, uh, what the authors did was uh, simulate the posterior probability model. Um, so sort of like a validation check on the Bayes rule. So we started off with defining our prior model of fake being 40%, real being 60%, and the likelihood function of 26.67% uh, of likelihood of the article being fake if it has exclamation marks and 2.2% uh, of it being real if it has exclamation marks. And then we did sort of like we simulated uh, 10,000 articles uh, as either fake or real, uh, which sort of uh, retained this prior probability model. So this sampling yields like roughly about 4,000 articles being fake and 6,000 articles being real, which sort of obeys this prior probability law of 46, 40% and 60%. And then uh, what we did was, okay, we now have like 10,000 simulated articles. Uh, and if the article is fake, then uh, sorry, if the article is fake, then the likelihood of it having an exclamation mark would be like 20, 26.6%. And if the article is real, real, then its likelihood of having an exclamation mark is 2.22%. So that's what we uh, tried to do here is sort of incorporate the data model. So for each article, first look at whether it's a fake one or a real one, and then we are assigning it whether it has an exclamation mark present or not. And then finally, to get the posterior probability model, out of all these 10,000 articles, we filtered out all the articles which have an exclamation mark. And then um, if you look at, if you look at uh, the percentage of articles out of this subset, which are fake versus real, uh, we ended up with like this 89 and 11%, uh, which neatly ties back to what we found out by Bayes' rule. Um, so this, in a way, validates or indicates uh, Bayes' rule or Bayes', uh, uh, Bayes a Bayesian approach to calculating the posterior probability uh, model. So that was um, the first example along with the posterior simulation. Uh, and then they had another example uh, on this pop versus soda versus Coke, which sort of seemed like an extension to the previous example, uh, with the only difference being that in the previous example, the prior probability model just had like two outcomes. So either fake 
or real. Whereas in this case, we had like four different outcomes. Uh, I, the person could be from the Midwest, Northeast, South or West. And, uh, and this example went about saying, okay, if in a television show, a participant comes and asks for a bottle of drink and they refer to it as uh, pop, uh, what is what are the chances that the person is from what's the probability that the person is from either midwest northeast south or west and here the prior probability model was based on like i think census data so south is like most densely populated so it got the probability of 38 percent followed by west midwest and northeast uh, but then based on the data model which was based, based on sort of like a a, a, a sample survey uh, it was found like, okay, the likelihood of the person being from uh, Midwest and calling the drink pop is 64.5%. Uh, and the person being from Northeast and calling it pop is 27.3%, so on and so forth. So, uh, and then the posterior model was simply calculated as the prior times likelihood divided by the normalizing constant, which is just a sum of the different uh, priors and likelihoods. And what was interesting in the posterior model that even though our prior understanding, uh, if we didn't know anything about uh, about the data, was that it's most likely that the participant is from the south. Uh, but after we after we gathered this data that they call pop, uh, they call called the fuzzy drink pop, uh, our posterior understanding changed that it Okay, it's most likely that the person is from Midwest, accounting for like there's a almost 50% chance that the person is from Midwest rather than South based on uh, on this data. So essentially we updated our prior probability to have more weighting to Midwest than South. In fact, South got like the least weighting after in light of the new data, which was I found it quite interesting. Um, so yeah, that's, that was like an extension of the of the previous example, uh, in a sense that we now had more than two output categories uh, in, in this example. Oh, any comments? Any any questions? Anyone had when going through these sections? Uh, thank you. I really like how you call this an extension of the previous example. Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah, because it seemed like um, very similar to the previous example in a sense that we still have like fake real. It's just that like it, instead of having like just two options, it's now four options, but the same principles still hold. So that was sort of my way of getting my head around uh, this example, which helped me. Okay, I think um, the final example um, or, or the final section in this uh, book was uh, sort of building a Bayesian model for random uh, variables. Um, and here they sort of introduced this example uh, in a sense, um, or I think this, this is sort of like um, a real example where uh, there was this chess match between uh, Deep Blue, a chess engine developed by IBM, and Kasparov, who was, I think, the reigning uh, world champion at that time. And they had like one match in 1996, and based uh, on the outcome of that match, um, we had, we sort of built like our prior model. And the way that this prior model was different to the previous examples was that um, instead of having sort of categorical um, categorical values, we had sort of like numeric values. So maybe I can think of this point two, point five, and point eight as sort of north, south, northwest in the previous example. But instead of them being sort of categorical value, we now have like numerical values. So the prior model, in a sense, the way that I sort of interpreted it and the way the book wanted explained it was that, okay, 
the probability that any Kasparov wins a game, any game, um, with a 20% chance that has sort of like a probability of 10. If he wins, there's a 50% chance of him winning the game, and that has a probability of 25%. And I mean, and there's an 80% chance of him winning a game. There's a 65% probability that there's an 80% chance that he wins the game. So it's like both of these, in a way, are probabilities, so to say. But it's just that we are assigning um, probabilities to probabilities, if that makes sense. Um, and this sort of sort of extend the data model extended quite naturally in a sense that, okay, um, now we have sort of our prior uh, model, which has like these probabilities in a way, and then. Um, we can say, okay, if if they were to play another round of say six games, um, what what would be the outcome of those games given the prior probabilities of 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.8? Well, not prior probabilities, but the uh, probabilities that, that the prior model can take. And this uh, was quite naturally modeled by a binomial distribution where we said, okay, we have, and like in 1997, we again end up with playing six matches. And okay, if we play six matches and um, there's there's a 20% chance of Kasparov winning each game and sort of the uh, implicit assumption here was that um, this 20% chance remained constant over each game. So it wasn't like if Kasparov lost the first game, then the strain percent would change in the second game, and also that the strain percent wouldn't fluctuate as they played the game. Uh, so it would remain constant. So in a way, it could be modeled by a binomial distribution with six n as six and the probability of success p as 0.2. And then in the second case, it could be uh, n is six and p is 0.5, and n is six and p is 0.8 in the third case. And then the data part of our Bayesian analysis was the result of these six matches, wherein Kasparov won just one game. So essentially, they played six games and they won one game. Uh, and, and the likelihood function here tries to capture, OK, what's, what's the likelihood of, of Kasparov's chances winning being 0.2 if he won just one game out of these six matches and what and similarly what what's the what's the likelihood or what what are the what's the relative chance of Kasparov's um, uh, Kasparov uh, winning probability being 0.5 if he won one game so on and so forth uh, and it turned out that um, the likelihood of Kasparov winning one game out of these six matches is most consistent to his um, winning probability being 0.2, which kind of make intuitive sense as well, because if we won one game out of six, so that's like one one by uh, one by six, which is sort of closer to 0.2 than sort of 0.5 or 0.8. And then the posterior probability model uh, simply simply um, was the product of or, or was proportional to the product of the prior and the likelihood, sort of weighing the prior where, which assigned sort of like uh, a 65% chance to Kasparov's probability being 0.8 to the likelihood that we, we just won one out of two games, which is more consistent with his, um, his chances of winning being 0.2. So combining these two pieces of information, the posterior model sort of reweighted the probability distribution to assign, in a way, more weight to 0.2 and 0.5, and a far lower weight to 0.8. Um, so this was also quite interesting to see that, okay, the prior model had a way higher probability assigned to the chances being 0.8, but then once we observe the data, we changed our understanding of this probability model, and now we are assigning 
more weightage to, to 0.2 and 0.5. So again, it's sort of it sort of felt similar to the other other two examples of the pop versus soda and the fake versus real uh, uh, real um, sort of case studies or examples, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but the only difference here was that this um, data model here, um, since we had in a way numerical numerical variables as part of the prior model, we may we were able to use sort of this uh, binomial model instead of having sort of like a discrete. Uh, so binomial is also so that's the wrong word, but rather than sort of like uh, a simplistic or a naive model than binomial model to capture capture the data model in a way. And I think they also had this uh, posterior simulation, which is again similar to how they did for the previous example, where, where we uh, sort of simulated uh, 10,000 uh, games or uh, 10,000 games and what, what the outcomes um, would be uh, or, or not ten thousand games, but ten thousand uh, prior probabilities, like 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, in the same uh, ratio as the prior model, and then against each of these, um, each of these, um, each of these um, probabilities or simulated probabilities, we then simulated sort of like. Uh, a binomial random variable um, of um, um, binomial random variable of sample size one uh, and n is six and probability of success pi. And then we filtered for all the rows which had game one as one to give us sort of the posterior uh, posterior probability model. And similarly, it sort of tied back to tie back quite closely to what we observed uh, in the by the by the base rule as well. So I think these were the two main sort of Bayesian analysis which this chapter talked about. One was where the prior model was made up of events, and the second one was where the prior model was made up of uh, in a way numerical. Uh, events or random uh, variables or quantitative variables in the prior model. Um, and I think then then in the exercises, uh, they just built upon this con concept of ba doing Bayesian analysis uh, in different, different examples or different use cases. Um, so just want to know, I think that more or less covers, covers this chapter. Uh, but if 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 anyone wants to discuss any of the exercises, or maybe if you want to do some I don't know some life coding, or if you want to share their examples, maybe you can do something like that. Uh, thank you, Kalsta, for really um, explaining this chapter and all. I think also in the near future, we will be able to add to these notes documents. Uh, for example, as you brought up, we could add on some of the textbook examples as, as well. Right, great, great idea. Uh, I think I, I did add sort of some tables just to make the examples a bit more clear, but uh, I totally agree with your idea that we can probably bring in more examples from the textbook. Maybe we can also have like a section for some of the exercises, like if not every exercise, but maybe some of them which, uh, which you want to discuss or which you found interesting. As for the book club itself, um, next week, we are going over a chapter three called the Beta Binomial Bayesian Model. If anybody wants to sign up to be a presenter for that, uh, feel free to do so. Otherwise, um, do we want to recover our time and end our meeting here? That's fine. That's fine with me. Good to see you all. And yeah, um, 
Have a good rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thanks.